In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. <coughs> this is the Feast of St. Teresa of the Child Jesus. The epistles taken from Isaiah chapter 66, one of her favorite passages in the scripture. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring upon her, as it were, a river of peace, in an overflowing torrent, the glory of the Gentiles, which you shall suck. You shall be carried at the breasts and at the knees, they shall caress you. As one whom his mother caresseth, so will I comfort you, and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. You shall see, and your heart shall rejoice, and your bones shall flourish like an herb, and the hand of the Lord shall be known to his servants. The Holy Gospel. It's taken from St. Matthew, chapter 18. At that time the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who thinkest thou is the greater in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called him unto him a little child, set him in the midst of them, and said, Amen, I say to you, unless you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, he is the greater in the kingdom of heaven. And he that shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. Thus are the words of the Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. There's one book all of you should read. Every Catholic should read, even at a very young age. And that is the story of a soul, the autobiography of St. Teresa of the Child Jesus. This is really a must for every Catholic and non-Catholic to lead them to the Catholic faith, to teach again that fresh simplicity, the innocence of a child that our Lord speaks of in this gospel. We all must convert We all must become as little children, or we're not going to enter heaven. And St. Teresa, among all the saints, she shows us and, and really emphasizes this spiritual childhood towards God, which is summed up in a great humility towards God, a great simplicity to glorify Him in all our intentions, and the purity of affections, and a great confidence, the great confidence in the sacred heart of Jesus. So at one point she says, all these huge saints are mountains and huge trees. And she said, but I will be a little flower, and I will be, I know I can't do anything great. Her health wasn't all that great, and she was a Carmelite nun. So she said, I will be very small. And what father and what mother, when they see the tiny child, just leaves him on the ground. They bend over and pick him up. And that's what our Lord will do to me, she says. If I make myself truly tiny, small, he will pick me up. And that will be my elevator to his heart, she said. She also... From a very young age, she received the gift of reason. And from the very moment of her use of reason, she, she had good parents that elevated her mind and directed her heart to high and noble affections towards the love of God. And of course, having older sisters who became Carmelite nuns, an example like that, like that can only inspire greatness in a soul because that's a a great tribute to her parents and 
at, at a young age, at age five, she lost her mother. This was a huge cross for her. And at age nine, she, and ten, she became very sick. And she had a high fever, and they thought maybe she would even take the turn for the worse. But she prayed, and it was a mysterious malady. This is what the breviary says about her. She tells us herself, she was delivered only by the power of God himself from this sickness, sickness through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who appeared to her with a smiling countenance, and to whom, under the title of Our Lady of Victories, she was constantly making novenas. Filled with angelic fervor, she prepared herself at this time with the utmost care to receive Christ in, in Holy Communion. So she was cured in this sickness by Our Lady seeing her smile. And one thing that St. Teresa did from her early childhood was to never refuse our Lord anything. Never refuse Him anything. So she would even say throughout her whole life, she never fell into mortal sin. But she said, that's not because of my virtue or me. She said, because our Lord in His goodness, seeing that I was small and I would easily fall and easily trip, He in His goodness removed these occasions of sin for me. So she had a great humility, which is nothing other than a supernatural, realistic view of how things really are. Pride is an illusion. Pride is a deception. Where we, as St. Paul says, we think ourselves above what we are when we're really nothing. And the saints had a deep, penetrating vision of reality, of what we are before God. And nothing but made from the slime of the earth. And all the gifts that we have were gifts from God. Everything we have is a gift from God. Gifts of the body, gifts of talents or skills, gifts of the soul, gifts even of the basic natural gifts of being able to walk and use your hands and being able to speak and to see and to listen, to hear. These are gifts. And when people don't have these gifts, such as the ability to walk or are crippled or handicapped or paralyzed or can't see or can't hear, they really know the value of these most simple gifts of God. And pride makes us forget. So St. Teresa teaches us the little way, it's called. And similar to St. John Bosco, in one of the visions and dreams of St. John Bosco, he saw himself and many of his brothers and priests walking over a whole carpet of red roses. And it showed their work with the youth. And from far it looks, looks easy, and it looks fun, and it looks not so hard. But they were actually walking on thorns, and it was extremely painful. From far it looks like a carpet of lush roses, but in the roses was thorns, and they were bleeding in their feet. So this is very similar to the little way of St. Teresa. It is little, but it's not the easy way, but it's the little way. And it's the surest way. Not easy because our Lord told us, whoever wishes to come after me must renounce himself, pick up his cross every day and follow me. So the love of God will chisel us in his loving goodness as a divine sculptor. He chisels us with crosses and tears and thorns and ups, uh, disappointments. Crosses with outside the whole political situation in the world and in the church. The whole loss of faith. Crosses from our neighbors. Crosses with those 
we may live with, crosses with, with those who may be relatives to us, our friends, and crosses from enemies, crosses from co-workers, crosses from bosses, crosses from our health, crosses from weather, crosses from where we live, our work, our uh, wherever we go. And sometimes the heaviest crosses are ourselves, our own selves. And with all this, Christ says, Come to me, all you who are burdened, and I will refresh you. So how do we come to him? We come to him the way he came to us as a little child, through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, through the Virgin Mary. So as he came to us small and through his mother, he wants us to come to him through his mother and small, humble of heart. And she will teach us this. And St. Teresa, the breviary says that she learned from the Virgin Mary this little way. After her first communion, says the breviary, St. Teresa developed an insatiable hunger for the heavenly food. Then, as if by inspiration, she asked Jesus to turn all her earthly consolation into bitterness. After that, she burned with the most tender love for Christ the Lord and for his church. So in her cell, it was kind of drafty and cold. And she had plenty of blankets, but it, it was never really warm enough. And this is where she caught the sickness that would uh, affect her lungs and she would bleed and die of the, this lung disease. More than anything in the world, she wanted to enter the order of the Discalced Carmelites when she was a young girl between now uh, 10 and 15, where by self-denial and self-sacrifice, she might assist priests, assist missionaries and the whole church, and so gain innumerable souls for Jesus Christ. So uh, she understood that our Lord loves souls. How can I help him rescue souls? She said, I will just give myself to him. That's it. I will simply love him and carry whatever cross he puts in my path. And that's the little way. That's her simple way. All this she promised God would do for her, even when apparently she lay at the point of death. Her extreme youth was an obstacle which hindered her entrance upon the religious life. Even this she overcame by her, her incredible courage of soul. So she entered the Carmel of Lisieux happily at the age of 15, at the very blossoming of her youth. And what, what was a factor in this was her trip to Rome that she describes in her autobiography. And on that trip she saw the priests, and she saw the priests could be very human and how they need prayers. And she was with her father, and she describes uh, grabbing some dirt from the tomb of St. Cecilia, where her incorrupt body was found in the 1600s. And she was martyred in the second century, first cent third century. And then she took soil. She went under the no trespassing sign, and she grabbed some soil dirt from the Colosseum, which was, this dirt was soaked in the blood of so many martyrs. So, and then she saw the Pope. And they were told, you don't talk to the Pope, you kneel down, you kiss his foot, and then you just get his blessing and quietly pass on. But in the soul of St. Teresa, 15-year-old girl, old girl she, she knew that the only way she could ever get permission to enter Carmel at a young age, because normally they had to be 18, was to ask the Pope himself. So here she was at the feet of the Pope and she, she broke the rule and she said to the Holy Father, Father, Holy Father, please give me permission to enter Carmel. I'm only 15. And this probably raised a stir in the papal audience of this upstart little girl, but it shows her courage and it shows her, her good spirit. 
her great love of God, which nothing would, would nothing could squelch that fire in her. And the Holy Father, Pope Leo XIII, he smiled and he said, My daughter, if it's God's will, you will enter. And it turns out, everything that happened, she ended up entering at age 15. But that didn't make it easy for her in the convent, because the mother, Mother Gonzag, who was the, the mother, the superioress, she thought this was a little bratty little girl. So St. Teresa would get the cold fish and cold soup after everybody had the warm soup. She would get the leftovers. And she really wanted to humble this proud little girl. So she thought. But St. Teresa never thought evil against her superior. She grew to love her mother, her mother superior in the convent. And took everything as from the hands of our Lord. And this teaches us a lot also. To see all that happens to us through people, through events, the hand of God. The breviary continues. It was in the convent that God fashioned the heart of St. Teresa in a marvelous way. As she herself would say, Lord, I am a ball of wax in thy hands. Shape me, squeeze me, form me into thee the way you want. So she, her, her whole disposition was one of absolute trust, surrender, and humility in the hands of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Our Lord taught her to ascend to him step by step, imitating the hidden life of the Virgin Mary. Like a well-watered garden, she bore flowers of every virtue, especially an abiding love of God and neighbor. And did she ever have plenty of chance to practice all the virtues in a convent? She describes, of course, the nun next to her during the washing of the laundry that splashed her with the dirty water, probably not knowing, maybe knowing, she doesn't know, but she, she wouldn't make a big fuss out of it. She would just quietly turn and wipe the, the water off her face and not make a big scene or give a big huff of disappointment and disgust. And she always smiled at that same sister. And remember the grumpy old nun that none of the sisters really looked forward to, to look after because she always complained. She was never happy. She was just an old grouch in a habit. But St. Teresa said, I'll take care of her. And she knew it would be very hard because all she did was put her down and verbally humiliate her and always complain. She never did anything right. And this, St. Teresa began, saw in this old nun to love her, to see Christ in her, and Christ forming her through this grouchy nun. So by love, she overcame. Isn't this the secret to keeping the good marriages between husbands and wives when things are so difficult and, and this man never seems to change? And this, this lady is just a nag, and I'm married to her. Well, she teaches us, all of us, see Christ in them. See Christ in your neighbor, in your husband, in your wife, in, your, in the sick, in the poor, in, in our boss, in our superiors even. See Christ in them, and love Christ in them. So... Also, she mentions in her autobiography that during meditation it would drive her absolutely mad. The sister behind her would be rattling her beads on the pew. And it would just drive her nuts. Now, someone told me once that that same nun also had false teeth. And during the meditation she would just chew on her false teeth and make this annoying noise behind her as well as rattling the beads so 
So most of us would turn around and, and say something or smack her or do something to show our displeasure. But St. Teresa saw in this a cross and she just turned it out of love for our Lord. Because some things we just can't change and we must simply bear patiently and this is the will of God, this little thorn, this little annoyance, this little pain, this little frustration, to bear with it with the love of God. So the breviary dives into a little bit of explaining her spiritual childhood. Listen to this. Thus, she might please the Most High God to greater degree when she read in sacred scripture the, warn, the warning Whoever is a little one, let him come to me. She determined to be a little one, a little flower in spirit. And such, as such, she consecrated herself forever with childlike confidence to God, her most loving Father. The little way of spiritual childhood, following the teachings of the gospel, she taught to others, especially to the novices, who, training in the pursuit of religious virtues, she undertook in obedience to her superiors. Overflowing with apostolic zeal, she pointed out to a world filled with pride and a love of vanities, the simple way of the Gospels. Meanwhile, Jesus, her spouse, inflamed her with the desire to suffer both in soul and in body. Moreover, perceiving that the love of God was everywhere rejected, she became filled with grief, and two years before her death offered herself as a victim of love to the merciful God. And this prayer you can find in her autobiography of her self-immolation as a victim of love. She writes, She was then wounded by a flame of fire from heaven, whereupon she became consumed by love, wrapped, as it were, in ecstasy, repeating over and over again the fervent words, My God, I love thee. She died and went to her spouse on September the 30th, 1897, at the age of 24 years. As she was dying, she promised that she would let fall upon earth a ceaseless shower of roses, this promise she has indeed fulfilled in heaven, and her shower of roses has continued to this very day. The sovereign pontiff, Pius XI, added her name to the virgins, declared blessed, and two years later at the time of the great jubilee, listed her among the saints. He also appointed and declared her patroness of all the missions. And during the canonization mass, there were flowers and roses decorating all throughout St. Peter's Basilica. And at the moment when the Pope declared, with the sun shining right through the stained glass windows and making large beams of light that penetrated from the height of St. Peter's down to the marble floor and reflecting light everywhere, one of these roses, as he declared her saint, one of the roses above him broke off high into the basilica and it just floated down like a circle and landed at his feet. So she already began after, right after her death, already in the convent of her sisters there were miracles happening. And many people throughout the world, it just spread throughout the whole world. Clearly the hand of God behind this. Everyone, many came to love and know and read her story of a soul of St. Teresa. And she was highly praised, of course, by Pope St. Pius X, who set her up as a model, and Pius XI made her patroness of the missions. Why? Because she never was a missionary, but she had the heart of one. She had the heart of a priest to save souls. She had the heart of a doctor to teach. She had the heart of a martyr to die for the faith. She had the heart of a crusader to fight against the enemies of Christ. And the amazing thing is that in heaven, 
She got all these crowns. She won them by her love and desire. So she has the crown of martyrdom, of a priest, a doctor, of a, of a crusader who died on battle, uh, on the battlefield, and a doctor of the church. So I, let me read her own words. To be your bride, Jesus, to be a Carmelite nun, to be through my union with you, the mother of souls, ought to be enough for me. That is not the case. No doubt those three privileges are my vocation, a Carmelite, a bride of Christ, and a mother, a mother of the novices. But I feel within myself other vocations, I feel the vocation of a warrior, a priest, an apostle, a teacher, a martyr. In short, I feel the need and the desire to accomplish for thee, Jesus, all the most heroic works. I feel in my soul the courage of a crusader, of a soldier in the papal army. I would like to die on a field of battle for the defense of the church. I feel within me the vocation of a priest. With what love, Jesus, would I bear you in my hands when at the sound of my voice thou wouldst come down from heaven? With what love would I give you to souls in Holy Communion? Of course, she's not a feminist. She, had no, she knew she could never be a priest, but in her heart she was. But alas, while desiring to be a priest, <clears throat> I admire and I envy the humility of St. Francis of Assisi, and I feel in myself the vocation of being like him in refusing the sublime dignity of the priesthood. O oh, Jesus, my love, my life, how do I harmonize these contrasts? How can I realize the desires of my poor little soul? Oh, in spite of my littleness, I would like to shed light on souls like the prophets, the doctors. I have the vocation to be an apostle. I would love to travel across the world, preach thy name, and plant thy glorious cross on the soil of unbelievers. But, my beloved, a single mission wouldn't be enough for me. I would at the same time like to preach the gospel in the five parts of the world, and as far as the remotest island, <coughs> I would like, love to be a missionary, not only for a few years, but I would like to have been one since the creation of the world and be one until the end of the ages. But above all, my beloved Savior, I would like to shed my blood for thee until the last drop. Martyrdom, that is the dream of my youth. That dream has grown within me under the cloisters of Carmel. But there again I feel that my dream is foolishness because I would not know how to limit myself to one type of martyrdom. To satisfy me, I would have to have all of them. <laughs> Being burned alive, drowned, stoned to death, shot, buried alive. Like thee, my beloved bridegroom, I would like to be scourged and crucified. I would love to die by being skinned alive like St. Bartholomew. Like St. John, I would like to be plunged into boiling oil. I would like to undergo all the tortures inflicted on all the martyrs. With St. Agnes and St. Cecilia, I would like to present my neck to the sword. And like St. John of Arc, my dear sister, I would like to be burned at the stake, murmuring thy name, Jesus. When I think about all the torments that will be the lot of Christians at the time of the Antichrist, I feel my heart leap, and I would like for those torments to be reserved for me. Jesus, Jesus, if I wanted to write down all my desires, I would have to borrow your book of life. In it are the records of the actions of all the saints, and those actions I would like to have accomplished them for thee. O oh my Jesus, to all my foolishness, what art thou going to reply? 
Is there a soul that is smaller and more powerless than mine? However, even because of my weakness, <coughs> Thou was pleased, Lord, to fulfill my little childish desires. And You now want to fulfill other desires that are bigger than the universe. At prayer time, my desires were making me suffer a true martyrdom. So I opened the letters of St. Paul in order to look for some sort of answer. <clears throat> Chapters 12 and 13 of the first letter to the Corinthians fell under my eyes. I read in the first of, the first of those chapters that everyone cannot be apostles, prophets, teachers, etc. That the church is composed of different members and that the eye cannot at the same time be the hand. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 29. The answer was clear, but it did not fulfill my desires. It did not give me peace. Just as St. Mary Magdalene, who kept bending towards the empty tomb, ending up finding what she was looking for, in the same way, abasing myself even as far as the depths of my nothingness, I raised myself so high that I was able to reach my goal. Without becoming discouraged, I continued my reading, and this sentence gave me relief. Quote, 1 Corinthians 12, 31. Now eagerly desire the greater gifts, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. And the apostle exclaims how the most perfect gifts are nothing without love, and that charity is the excellent way that leads souls surely to God. Finally, I had found rest. Considering the mystical body of the church, I had not recognized myself in any of the members described by St. Paul, or rather, I wanted to recognize myself in all of them. Charity gave me the key to my vocation. I understood that if the church had a body composed of different members, it was not missing the most necessary, the most noble of all. I understood that the church had a heart, and that this heart was burning with love. I understood that love alone can cause the members of the church to act. If love were to be extinguished, the apostles would no longer preach the gospel. The martyrs would refuse to shed their blood. I understood that love contains all the vocations, that love is all, that it embraces all times and all places, in a word, that it is everlasting. Then, in the excess of my delirious joy, I cried out, O oh Jesus, my love, I have finally found my vocation. My vocation is love. Yes, I have found my place in the church, in that place, my God, you have given me. In the heart of the church, my mother, I will be love. That way I will be everything. That way my dream will become a reality. And she goes on to say and pray that she will consecrate herself to immolate herself as a victim of love to be totally given to the love of our Lord. Now, I said after her death, of course, there were many miracles. Let me just give one of them. <clears throat> and I hope through these examples and her own words that you also will be inflamed to embrace her little way, to love our Lord and to imitate His simplicity her simplicity towards our Lord and her, her, her way of spiritual childhood. So this happened on February 25th, 1910 in Gallipoli, Italy. There was a convent of Carmelite nuns. So this is 1910. This is under the reign of St. Pius X. This is about uh, 8 to 12 years after her death. <clears throat> And the mother superioress of the Carmelite convent was coming down with a fever. She was getting sick. And there was no money left in the money box. 
So they were really struggling. <clears throat> and she probably had endured, you know, some of the, the quiet complaints of the sisters. There was not much to eat, and it was cold, and it was just things were going rough for the car convent. So they prayed to St. Teresa. But she wasn't a saint yet. She was just known as Sister Therese. And so one night she went to bed and, and she fell asleep. And she felt, she saw out of the corner of her eye a, 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 one of the sisters coming to her and, and laying a blanket on her and kind of tucking her in bed. And she told the sister, thank you very much, but you don't need to do this. And the sister said, she said to the mother, come and follow me. So the mother superior got out of bed and she walked over and she said, St. Teresa it was, who appeared to her, and she had the money in her hands, 500 lire. And she said, but I can't leave this money in your cell because it's against the rule to have money in our cells. So she said, follow me to the money box. So the sister, the mother, thought she was dreaming. And St. Teresa led her down the hall and she went down to the front office area <clears throat> where there was the money box. And she put the money in the box. And... So the mother said to St. Teresa, she says, uh, going down the hall, she said, no, this is the wrong way. And St. Teresa said, no, my daughter, my way is safe, nor am I wrong. My way is the sure way. And she was speaking of her, her little way of spiritual childhood. And so the, the sister went back to bed, and she thanked St. Teresa and she said, she said, are, are you St. Teresa of Avila, our mother? And this is 1910, so St. Teresa was the 1500s. And she said, no, I am not. I, I am St. Teresa of the child Jesus. I am St. Teresa of Lisieux, Sister Teresa of Lisieux. And you, you turned to me and I promised I will send showers of roses to help. And sure enough, in the morning, the sister, the mother, she told her dream to two of the nuns that came to see her in her cell because she was sick. And the sisters insisted, well, check the money box. Maybe it wasn't a dream. And she said, no, you know we're not allowed to believe in dreams. That's the ghost thing. It's the catechism. But they said, no, just check it. So she got up and went and went to the money box, opened it, and she found the 500 lire that St. Teresa put in there. And she understood this, saint, this Sister Therese was a saint in heaven. She was looking after them, and her little way really was the sure path to heaven. And the whole convent embraced the spirit of the ch childhood towards God, and they all rose in holiness of life. So this happened actually not just once, but numerous times. And even the bishop came and tested it and sealed an envelope and found when he opened the envelope with the seal unbroken, it had more money to cover the expenses of the convent. So this is just one of millions of miracles granted to St. Therese. So let's turn to St. Teresa of the Child Jesus in this Mass. Let's turn to her and ask her, look, you're in the glory of heaven and you promised you would not turn a deaf ear. You would help us here on earth. And we need your help more than any time in history. We need your help for the grace of love of God, to love him, to love the Catholic faith, to love our Lord above all things. Love the Catholic truth. Give me that, that true love of God and a strong faith and the great humility of heart to never become blinded by pride and to have always a childlike confidence in our Lord so that even should we trip and fall, we get right back up and come to Him. 
So ask her great things. St. Teresa is very powerful. Ask her great things. She promised she will send a shower of roses from heaven. She may not always answer when we want, but she always answers. So let's always love this great saint. And again, I I repeat, read her little story of a soul. Read it. Read it again in a few times before the end of your life. You will always draw something great from it to help your soul advance. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.